Hello, Politified, and welcome to our official Stefan Kinsella interview. I'm joined by my friends Benjamin Politics and Chris, and of course our special guest Stefan Kinsella. Thank you so much for for joining the interview. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Sitting on my balcony, a slightly crisp day here in Houston, and uh, I'm going to smoke a pipe while we talk. Sounds great. So we're going to go straight into the questions, uh, starting with one from Chris. Chris, if you don't mind. Hello, political. All right. So uh, first off, we kind of just wanted to start on the uh, the election. What were your thoughts on the election? Did you have any prediction or any preferred candidate? Oh, I preferred Trump, for, of course. Um, sure. Not that I mean, I'm a libertarian, but yeah, I think that the social the, the Democrats are way more dangerous than the um, than, than Trump, especially. And uh, but I I, I, um, I bet against him, and I I was right, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So I'm did not surprised have, that he lost. Yeah. Did you have uh, any any kind of views on Joe Jorgensen? I know a lot of libertarians uh, at this point voted for her over Trump. Uh, I I like I usually don't vote, by the way, but um, I usually uh, I usually. Uh, yeah, I liked her. I, I like all libertarian candidates that are actual libertarians, uh, um, including I, including Gary Johnson from last time. Um, I wouldn't have voted for someone like uh well, Bill Weld, if he had run, or who was it? Was it a guy named Barr that ran several years ago? Um, the guys that are not real libertarians. Um, but uh, even though she's a soft libertarian, as far as I know, she seems pretty solid to me. Um, so you have come to prominence often for defending Hoppe's ethical framework of argumentation uh, ethics. Um, for those unaware of, of his ethical framework, can you give us some a brief synopsis of it? Sure. Um, so the libertarian approach, at least uh, as viewed by most, uh, I'd say, uh, thinking libertarians or principled libertarians, you know, not just freedom or prosperity, but it, it's the non-aggression principle, right? The idea that we libertarians oppose aggression, and so the only laws we're in favor of, and the only use of force, because all laws are backed by force, the only use of force that we favor is a, for, a use of force in response to someone who initiated force, right? So that's the non-aggressive principle. So then the question is, why are we in favor of that, or how do you justify it, right? As opposed to the the rule that all other political philosophies hold. I mean, I really think it's libertarianism versus everything else. Uh, every other political philosophy is basically some different flavor of socialism or slavery really because it means that some group or someone outside yourself basically owns your owns your body to some degree even in the US with democracy like you know the uh, the idea of conscription or taxation or the drug war implies that the the government owns your body right they can send you off to war they can put you in a cage if you don't abol- uh, fo- follow their rules um, so and some libertarians are more pragmatic or consequentialist, Bella, um, and they justify their adherence to libertarian. You know, this is what works. Um, it maximizes happiness or utility or, or prosperity if we have free market rules, which I agree with. But um, other other thinkers, Bella, that's my poodle barking. <laughs> other thinkers. Um, um, have a more natural rights approach, right? So the standard Aristotelian view is that um, is a natural law approach, like based upon the nature of man. Bella, come here. Based upon the nature of man, we have certain natural rights, right? And most people believe that to a certain degree, but libertarians believe it more consistently than anyone else. Um, there are some problems with the natural law approach. One of them being the uh, the is ought gap that David Hume pointed out, which is. You can't derive an ought from an is because you're going from one domain of statements about what the way things are, a descriptive statement, to the way things should be, which is an ought statement, like you shouldn't hurt someone. Um, I think there's still something to that, but there are some problems with it. But Hoppe, Hans Hermann Hoppe, who's an Austrian, a German guy, who's an Austrian economist and a libertarian thinker who studied under Rothbard, uh, he also studied under a German philosopher named Jürgen Habermas, who I believe is still living. He's very old. He's a lefty, but he came up with something called discourse ethics and another German guy named Karl Otto Appel. And that's the idea that when people come together to discuss norms, like which norms or rules are justified, there are certain presuppositions of of the argumentation context itself, 
which you can never deny because you would be contradicting yourself because you have to assume those are valid just to enter into discourse about what norms are valid. So then the question is what are those presupposed norms? And Hoppe took his teacher's approach and he bent it in a um, libertarian direction using his Austrian economic insights and his Rothbardian political radicalism. And his, his basic argument is that um, when we argue about what our rights are, right? what laws are justified, what uses of force between each other are justified, we're doing that in the context of a civilized, peaceful discussion where we respect each other's um, uh, bodily rights because if I'm trying to persuade you of something, I have to be acting peacefully. So this concept of peace is at the root of any discussion, and therefore if you just extend that, you'll see that uh, the only higher level political norms that are compatible with that presupposition of peace is the libertarian, um, the libertarian non-aggression principle because ultimately every other ethic is socialistic, and a socialistic ethic in the end says that I can hit you, but you can't hit me. But that's contrary to the peaceful context of an – or the peaceful setting of an argument. So that's sort of a nutshell version of, of his approach to justifying libertarian rights. His approach really is to establish a filter to filter out any norm or any political ethic that is not libertarian because any anything that's not a libertarian norm contradicts the peaceful presuppositions of discourse itself. Uh, I'm going to be asking the next question, and it's pretty much related to that one. Um, why do we have self-ownership, and how do we prove that we own ourselves? So what it would mean to be a self-owner, and that's actually a slightly misleading formulation, which I've used myself before, but you don't really own yourself. You own your body um, because we only – all human rights are property rights, and all property rights are the right to control a given scarce resource. That is a type of thing that can be controlled, which Mises calls means, scarce means of action. That would include your body, but self is kind of a nebulous term. Um, uh, so usually when we say self-ownership, we mean you own your body. So the reason you're the self-owner is because you have a better claim to it. Now, this is Hoppe's argument, which I agree with. Um, it's slightly different than the argument for why we, why, why we have property rights in scarce resources in the world, like external objects. We own those because they're unowned, and some human being in acting seizes control of those means to do something, and when he does that, he plucks them out of the state of being unowned, and he, he basically establishes a connection between himself and the thing that other people can see and observe, and they can respect if they want to respect property rights, um, or you, you buy it. From someone else who was an owner by contract. So the only two ways of gaining ownership of those external resources is by homesteading, being the first user of something that was unowned, uh, or by getting it by contract from someone else. But in the case of your body, you can't homestead your body because you have to have a body to act in the world in the first place, so it wouldn't make any sense. So when the question is for, for scarce resources in the world, when there's a dispute over them, and you want to know who get who has the, pro, the the better claim to own that resource? It's the person who 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 had it first, or who got it by contract from a previous owner. But in the case of your body, the question is who owns your body? Now that question can only be answered in a in a debate, in a discourse, in an argumentation, as Hans would say, Hoppe would say. And whenever you're discussing with someone else, you are already assuming that they own their body because you're directing your argument. To them as another equal participant in discourse. So you assume that you own your body, and you have to assume he owns his because if you don't assume he owns his body, then you're basically threatening him. You're saying, accept my argument or I'll hit you, right? which is not a real argument. So if you really are engaged in genuine argument, you have to be granting him ownership of his body so that he can have the independence to consider your arguments and decide whether or not to accept it as true, right? So it's a presupposition of any any attempt to come up with who owns whose bodies that we each own our, our bodies. Uh, another way to look at it is that um, I'm the direct controller of my body, so I have a better claim to it than someone else. Likewise, they have a better claim to their body. Um, 
if anyone says they own me, they're claiming to be a self-owner of themselves first right? because they have to own their body to then claim ownership of me as the master over me. But if they own their body, it has to be for some reason, and whatever that reason is, I have the same reason for me because we're equally situated. right? So it wouldn't make any sense for them to claim ownership of themselves and to deny it to me because that would not be an argument. That would be just what we call a particularizable statement. It would just be saying, well, this is the rule for me, but this is the rule for you. But that's not an argumentation that you can have in a peaceful discussion because you have to presuppose that we're both equal participants in the discourse in the first place. Uh, I have another question, and that is how does argumentation ethics and self-ownership uh, come into play with a newborn or a fetus, for example? Um, I mean, opinions vary on this. I have my own views, and Hoppe has his views, and Rothbard, who, who endorsed Hoppe's argumentation ethics before his death, um, have different views on this, um, and they all are roughly the same. Um, my view is that uh, human rights, by the, by the virtue of the argumentation ethic, they apply to actors and actors who can communicate. Now, a, a newborn infant can't really communicate yet, but it is fully developed and has the capacity to communicate. So I think it makes sense as humans to attribute rights to him. And in fact, I think even earlier, I think I think even when the when the when a developed fetus is inside the the mother's womb, I think we can say at a certain point it has rights. Um, not in the beginning when it's just an embryo or or a zygote. Um, not Looks like we're having some connection All issues here. Right. Um, it's that the mother, in most cases, where she voluntarily has sex and becomes pregnant, you can't call the, the fetus a trespasser like Walter Block does because it's there by invitation of the mother. And uh, so I think that abortion in later stages is morally problematic. Not that I would favor any laws against it because it's still such a private matter that to enforce this would 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 violate so many rights that it would be inconceivable. Um, but I think in principle, it's it's more and more morally problematic to commit abortion. Uh, that's just discretionary abortion. That is, I mean, for, for the life of the mother, that's one thing. So I think the way we look at it is when the child is born, we have to treat them as a human with rights. However, it doesn't have a capacity to make decisions for itself yet. So we assume as a presumptive matter that the parents are the natural guardians and can make decisions for the child until the child um, becomes more independent at a certain age. And I, I think 18 is far too late, by the way. And in fact, I think very at a very young age, if the child wants to declare his own independence, as, long, as, as soon as he can do it and be recognized by members of the community um, as choosing his own independence, then he has the right to do that. All right, so. Oh, my bad. Um, are you asking something related to that question? Because I was going to ask another question. Okay. So, what are your thoughts on the idea that self ownership is ad infinitum? Which has been gaining a lot of current popularity among minarchists. What does that mean, ad infinitum? Um, Chris gave me this question, so you have to ask. Him. Like you can't. You mean like, the it, like an like an infinite own. regress? Yes. Oh, yes. oh, right. Yeah, I've heard that before. Um, I think it's ridiculous. Uh, Walt, even Roderick Long, who's a fellow anarchist, and he's more of a, a Aristotelian type, um, and he's a philosopher. Uh, he agrees with me that. The, the objection is is ridiculous. Um, there is there's no reason you can't be the owner of your I won't say yourself, but of your body. Um, conceptually and even legally, the concept of a person is distinct from the concept of a body. Just like the concept of your mind is different than the concept of your brain. I'm not saying something spooky and religious or mystical. Uh, like the brain, the mind exists without the brain. There's a there's a connection, but the mind and the brain are not the same thing. For example, uh, a dead body has a brain, but it doesn't have a mind, right? And uh, the brain has a, a size and a location and a weight, but the, your mind doesn't have a weight. So these are just different concepts. They refer to different things in reality. One is a physical object, and one is a phenomena that is spun off of. Uh, 
or you know, it's like a computer program code running on a computer processor. The processor is not the code, and the code is not the processor, but they're related. And likewise, the person is not the same thing as the body. It depends upon the body. You have to have a body to be a person. Um, and so, but in 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 the world, in civilization, and in law. The question is always there are different actors in the world or persons that can have a conflict or a dispute over who gets to use a resource, and that can include human bodies obviously because there are physical fights, and there is enslavement and murder and assault and battery and things like that, and sexual activity, interactions, touching, and the question is who has the right to use that resource? So the, the answer is either me or someone else, right? Or we say the body is unowned, which again is saying that everyone owns it. It's just fair game. Anyone can shoot you because if they can, you know, that's that's sort of a, a might makes right view of everything. But we libertarians want to ask, want to say who the who has the right. Um, so I think any anyone who objects to self ownership or to body ownership by saying, oh, you can't own yourself because um, you are yourself, well. They're really trying to find a contorted reason to say that someone else owns you, and usually I'm not surprised Minarchists do this because a Minarchist doesn't want to grant full ownership of your body to yourself because that would that would rule out uh, the government having the right to tax you or to put you in jail if you don't pay taxes or to prevent you by force from using your own chosen defense agency by outlawing all competing agencies. Right? They don't want to grant you full rights over your body. Um, so I think it's just a it's just a, a it's a lazy dishonest way of trying to justify force. Um, it's sort of like something I think Ayn Rand said it. Um, if someone says um, you're too concerned about money, right? You're a materialist. You're too much. You're too greedy. Hold on to your wallet because they're coming after it, right? Anyone who tells you you're too concerned about money. That means they really are concerned about money. They just want your money from you. And anyone who tells me I'm not a self-owner, that means they want to say who the owner of my body is. So I I see no uh, – to say you're the self-owner or you're the owner of your body is simply a way of saying we oppose slavery. So if you oppose self-ownership, you're in favor of slavery. You're in favor of someone else having the right to control your body other than you. So I say the best owner of your body is you. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've gone over the uh, symposium in, the, in Liberty Magazine that where argumentation ethics was first proposed. What did Correct. you? What was your reaction uh, when Hoppe's argument was generally disregarded by I think everyone except Rothbard and David Gordon? Uh, did you think that was what? What did you think of I guess libertarian? Um, I would say even David Gordon disregarded. It. He was polite, but David Gordon doesn't okay. accept it either. Um, I guess I didn't care too much. I was in law school and I read it, and it blew it blew me over. I thought it was I thought it was genius and brilliant, and um, uh, I was a little bit surprised that so many libertarians were against it. But I, I think uh, half of them, and Hoppe has responded to all these, by the way, some in the Liberty Symposium and some in other writing, and he collected them. It's in the appendix to his uh, the, uh, uh, the Economics and Ethics of Private Property. It's called Four Replies, mm -hmm. and and he and by the way about. Three or four years ago at the Property and Freedom Society meeting in Turkey, which he holds annually, he gave uh, – he hasn't talked much about argumentation ethics ever since that initial round of debate in the late 80s, um, which is one reason people keep calling me about it because Hans is still alive and doing well, but he, he doesn't always respond to these things. It would be better if he did, but he did give a long speech about it, kind of re representing his argument and – and addressing some of the criticisms, it's it's on his site, and it is uh, I think from 2016 mm -hmm. or 15. Uh, it's 2017. I'm pretty sure. 2017. Okay, yeah. so uh, that's so that and his four replies are the are the best response to all this. Um, I think half of them are basically <laughs> kind of were jealous of him coming onto the scene <laughs> and being adopted uh, as Rothbard's designated sort of protege uh, and Rothbard's claim. Uh, 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 Rothbard's um, uh, praise of his argument, um, and it was sort of a new argument, and it sort of um, displaces the previous attempts, and it's, it's brilliant, and some people are just locked into their own way of thinking, and they don't want to go there. Some are utilitarians. Um, 
and some just seem to misunderstand the argument. Um, so I, I guess I'm not surprised. There's always petty bickering among intellectuals in certain movements, and they hold on to their little domains, you know. Um, mm. Plus, he's German, you know. A lot of Americans don't <laughs> like Germans because they're Nazis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what was your reaction to David Friedman's critique of it, uh, and also Robert Murphy? I, I know those are two big anarcho-capitalists who who still hold well, critique. I thought Friedman's – I can't remember in specific, but I remember thinking it was silly. Um, it, it didn't convince me at all. Um, of course, Friedman Friedman's doesn't really have an argument for rights at all, um, and in fact, David Friedman, despite being this high-level thinker on anarchist libertarian topics, is not even good on intellectual property, and you know that's sort of my litmus test. This is one of the easiest issues of all. It's an important issue, and if you're supposed to be a serious libertarian thinker and you can't get intellectual property right, there's something wrong with your approach to everything. Um, I mean, David Friedman is basically some kind of Chicago type Kosian utilitarian, right? Which I think is totally mm -hmm. incoherent, and it's not the way to justify. I'm actually surprised David Friedman is as good as he is on libertarian theory, given his his weak foundations. Um, now, Bob Murphy didn't write in that symposium. He was just a kid at the time. He yeah. did write later with Gene Callahan, who <laughs> who I used to be friends with, and who used to be. Pretend to be an Austrian and used to pretend to be a libertarian, and now he's neither. Um, and they wrote this thing in uh, for antistate.com attacking Hoppe's argumentation ethics, and I wrote a response to it. And um, uh, so I, I have a lot – it's called defend – I think my response is defending argumentation ethics in which I tried to represent Hoppe's argument in a way that wasn't subject to their criticism because I thought they were getting lost in the weeds. I mean… Bob Murphy believes in rights, um, mm. maybe from a Christian point of view or something. Now I'm not really sure exactly, but I try to make the point that the the, the central thing that they're missing is this: um, once you can see that there is anything whatsoever to the idea that there are normative presuppositions in argumentation, then you've lost because. Um, then the question is, what are they? And if you're a libertarian, you already agree. With the non-aggression principle, so you must think there's something to this idea of, of peace, right? Um, so it'd be hard to say that I think there are some moral or normative ethical presuppositions or argument, but they're not even related to liberty and peace if you're a libertarian. And so – and and this ties into what Kant called the universalizability requirement, right, which Hoppe relies on in his argument. Because he's kind of Kantian in some of his thinking, just like Mises was in his um, in his uh, in his epistemology for his uh, uh, for his economic thinking. Um, if you grant that when you give an argument for something in an argument, it has to be universalizable. That is, you have to give reasons for it, um, and which is what argument really is. You have to give a reason. You can't just assert it arbitrarily, and you can't just do something that I, I said before is particularizable. Like you can't give an argument an ethic that's particular to you and not it's not generalizable to the other person. You can't say, well, it's okay for me to steal your property, but you can't steal mine because I am me and you're you. That's not an argument. You're not giving a reason. You're you're just stepping outside of argument and you're just saying I'm gonna take what I can take, which is not argument. That's might makes that's might makes right. That's not uh, right makes right. Um, and so I try to get Bob to focus on whether they agree that universalizability itself is a criteria for advancing any kind of ethical claim. And he seemed to start admitting that. And once you admit that, then I think you can't really have a principled disagreement as a libertarian with Hoppe's approach. Uh, but we never got that far. I think we might have talked about it one more time since in a podcast, Bob and I. I think I was on his show. A couple yes. of years ago, yeah, and I didn't make much progress. We're, we're friends; um, we have a friendly disagreement on that issue, but um, I just think he's wrong because he doesn't really have a solid foundation for rights, which is not to criticize him. Lots of libertarians don't, and that's fine. They just take that for granted, like Randy Barnett, for example, or Robert Nozick. Uh, although Robert Nozick um, um, goes astray when he defends the minimal state, but um, 
it's it's fine if you just take rights for granted. That's not your specialty is to defend what rights are. But if you if you don't have your own theory of rights and why you believe in them, and you evidently do believe in them if you're a libertarian, it's just odd to criticize Hoppe for coming up with another argument for rights. Like if you say Hoppe's wrong for rights, but yet you believe in rights and you don't have your own theory of rights, how are you any better than Hans it, by your lights? So here are two here are two libertarian thinkers who both believe in rights. And neither one of them have a good argument for rights. So what? Right? So like Murphy has no argument for rights that I'm aware of. And he's criticizing Hans for having no good argument for rights, but yet they both believe in rights. Okay, so what's your alternative? So all you're saying is Hans is no better than you, which is just I guess it's a cute point to make, but <laughs> what's your argument for rights? You know, mm -hmm. at least Hans tried, and I think it has some intuitive appeal and some nice rigorous appeal too. A question on, on the Mises Institute specifically. You've had a very friendly relationship with those at the Mises Institute and uh, other anarcho-capitalists. Who do you think is your biggest influence to your ideology and why? Well, chronologically it would be Ayn Rand, but I've, I've, I've drifted a lot from her thinking, although a lot of, a lot of the things she, 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 um, she wrote about still influence me but i'd say my biggest influences in terms of what i built on and what i'm really compatible with would be hoppe mises and rothbard um probably in the or in, probably in the order hoppe rothbard than mises um and mises more for his methodology and his economics than for his politics but rothbard's radical capitalist radical libertarian thinking and his radical politics and then Hoppe's um, more rigorous building upon that. See, what what Hoppe does that that Rothbard doesn't do as much is Hoppe keeps in mind the the central fact of scarcity, and I think that's because he was such a Misesian, and Mises does that too in his economics. Rothbard loses sight of that sometimes, which is why he wasn't quite as clear on intellectual property, whereas Hoppe. Saw, saw the right way uh, to view intellectual property instantly without even knowing a lot about it. Someone asked him in 1988 in a panel before I even started writing on this issue. He said, what about ideas? Who can own those? And Hoppe just instantly said, well, they're not a means of action. Uh, means of action are scarce resources that people can have a conflict over. And we need property rights in those, but ideas are just uh, like a free resource once it's known to the public, anyone can use that to guide their actions. So property rights don't even apply, which is basically the right, the right answer. And he saw that right away. Rothbard didn't quite get there. I think he would have if he had lived another two years. Uh, he would have he would have gotten there, but he died in '95, right when I started writing on this. Um, I'm confident that Rothbard would have seen that because Rothbard's views on defamation law were correct. He he understood that you can't have a right to your reputation. Because it's what other people think about you, and so to own your right to, to to own your reputation, which is what underlies defamation law, libel and slander, um, means you own other people's brains. And like I said earlier, uh, 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 in intellectual property is the same thing. If you own uh, the, the the copyright to a book, it's a pattern of information, and if you own the patent to an invention, it's still a design for an, for 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 uh, for a device. It gives you property rights over other people's bodies and their factories and their printing presses, um, and I think if that had been pointed out to him, he would have seen that. What are your uh, thoughts on like the recent accusations of any left libertarians or, or many uh, progressives have been giving uh, Hoppe and the Mises Institute saying they're uh, neo-Nazis or fascists or racist or, or sympathizers to these groups? Um, what, do, what do you generally think about the, like, these people? And what they do? Their accusations hold any water? Um, I mean, I think basically it's all bullshit. <laughs> I think I think this comes from the respectable libertarians, the who are usually compromising, minarchist or quasi status sellouts. Um, um, part of it's from petty infighting and squabbles and personality fights over the over the decades that I don't I don't really care about. Uh, I think it's, it's it's not it's total nonsense. I mean, these people are basically allying with the 
with the state and the, and the, and, the, and academia and the left, right, with their continual dishonest lies and smears and distortions and you know calling anyone they don't agree with a racist or um, or a Nazi. Uh, I think it's, it's it's insane. There there are some alt right types um, who gravitate towards more of the right leaning libertarians sometimes, but that's not our fault, you know, any more than. Uh, you know, insane, insane commies. You know, following uh, like Antifa, following uh, some Democrats is exactly their fault. Although I think it's somewhat compatible with what they say. Um, you know, left libertarians don't have any monopoly over the the hatred of fascism, and we shouldn't have to keep keep explaining that over and over again. You know, they don't have a mo monopoly over virtue. In fact, I think that some of them. Um, you know, they're left libertarians, the, especially the anarchists, tend to be really good. Um, I don't really care what their personal cultural preferences are about capitalism and things like that, as long as they don't want to make laws about it. And some of them, some of them do, like the mutualist types, sometimes do. Uh, but as long as you respect property rights, like Ro like Roderick Long is, is the best among these guys because he's a hardcore property rights respecting so-called left libertarian. But um, no, the accusations against the Mises Institute are, are just are insane. I mean, I've been to these things all years, and I, I detest racism. And um, uh, I'm a cosmopolitan. I'm an atheist. I'm, uh, you know, we're, we're for freedom of for tolerance and diversity and all this stuff. Um, like any normal person is, you know. Um, so I think there's nothing to it whatsoever. So as as you know, the internet has been a, a, a big safe space for people, especially libertarians, to dis discuss their their ideologies and economic thought. Who do you think will be the newfound revival of Rothbardian and anarcho-capitalist movements through the internet? Internet. Um, well, I think that you know, in the 80s and 90s, the Mises Institute was sort of the core place, especially because Jeff Tucker um, started pushing them to release so many works, public domain basically, right? Made so many resources available. It was a central hub. I think that that role has faded because the internet has grown so much, and there's so many. There's been a diaspora of groups. There's a lot of Mises institutes around the world, and other groups too. Now, um, I don't think it's any central place anymore. Um, I think the LP Mises Caucus is pretty good in terms of the LP. Um, the Property and Freedom Society that Hans has started in Turkey is nice, but it's more of a select niche group. Um, I just think that the works of Rothbard and Mises and Hop, Hoppe and related thinkers uh, is very popular in other nationalities too, like in Brazil and in, 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 in the Spanish in Latin America um, and in Europe, different parts of Europe, especially Eastern Europe, uh, formerly Eastern European countries, all the, all the places that, that have suffered under socialism more violent violent than we've had seem to appreciate it um, but there's always a battle and radicals and in some ways more radical like there's more anarchists now but it's grown less intellectual um, back when I was you know, in the beginning, in the in the eight seventies, and the eighties, and even the nineties, the movement was smaller and even maybe more minarchist. Like the Randy and the Ayn Rand, the objectivists dominated more, who were minarchists and not quite as radical. But most these people were more well read because there wasn't the internet, there wasn't podcasting, and there was fewer books to read too. So there was like a more limited group of of the signal books to read, and a lot of people read them. Modern younger libertarians don't seem to read as much in terms of books, the, even the old classics. Um, so they're a little bit less deep in their intellectualism, although they, they go deep into intellectual ideas with, with this kind of debating on the internet like we're doing now. Um, so that has been a change. I don't know if it's for good or for, or for bad. Um, probably it's for good overall.
So I think the movement continues to grow. And I do think that there's a um, – as the, as technology keeps growing, right, and lets us communicate and move around the world and escape regimes, um, um, that that will make people just naturally more libertarian-ish in their inclinations. right? The idea of freedom of speech is sort of ingrained in most people now. Um, the idea that central planning fails because communism failed in, in, in the late – in the early 90s in Russia and Soviet Union. Um, I think over time we have a gradual increase in economic literacy of the people, even though they don't have any formal education in it. Um, you've been to a lot of the property and freedom society uh, things with Hoppe. Do you have any specific favorite ones or favorite panels you've been on? Um, well, I really enjoy most of Hoppe's talks and uh, lots of the other talks too. Um, I, I think I enjoy, the couple that I've given that I enjoyed giving and the feedback, uh, I gave one on libertarian mistakes and controversies, something like that, and it just went through things that libertarians often get wrong, not through their own fault, but just because they're difficult issues and they trip people up. And as the as the philosophy matures and develops, you know, we, we start seeing errors people used to make. Um, that was a fun one. I think I called it libertarian mistakes or something like that. Um, or fallacies or misunderstandings or misconceptions. And then the other one was on corporations because that's always a hot topic, and I got a lot of feed, a lot of uh, pushback like from Sean Gabb, who's another friend of mine. He's an English libertarian. Um, you know, Defending corporations is hard to do when you have especially the left libertarian impulse to hate corporations and say that they're creatures of the state. But if you have a kind of nuanced understanding of the way law works… And you think it like a Rothbardian in terms of contracts and property rights. Uh, I think you could see that uh, something like a corporation could exist by private contract alone, and that the things that some libertarians criticize corporations for as being a privilege granted by the state um, is not really a privilege. It's just the way it would be without the state being there at all, like limited liability for shareholders. That was a fun one, I thought. Uh, what do you think about this new critique? I think it was formulated on Bleeding Heart, uh, Bleeding Heart Libertarians page. The critique on uh, Hoppe's argumentation ethics that he conflates a liberty right with a claim right. I don't remember the nuances of that. Um, um, I think, I think, in my, I did a long review essay. Um, reviewing Hoppe's second book, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property, in a law review in 1994. And I, I noted that a couple places Hans Hoppe, um, uh, he, he sort of um, conflates two senses of the word uh, uh, right or property right. Like in some senses, he uses it more descriptively, like in an economic sense, like Mises would, like the ability to control a resource. And in some senses, he uses it like a right, like a legal right, and he uses one sense to justify the other. And that's similar, I think, to this this criticism you're pointing out. But as I mentioned in my article, I think that that's only a slight criticism, and that if he, if he just was if he reworded it, it would it would he could salvage it. It would work just fine. Um, you got to remember, he's not a native English speaker, and uh, he did get some editing help, uh, like from his first wife. On a lot of that stuff, but sometimes talking in these hyper precise, um, uh, these hyper uh, intricate uh, political terms in another language, uh, you know, you might misspeak on occasion. But I, I think ultimately his his argumentation ethic um, is sound, and I think it's one of the best ways to defend um, the non aggression principle that we all agree with. Libertarians are very – libertarians and anar anarcho-capitalists are very divided on a lot of things, especially uh, immigration. On your immigration view, do you tend to stand more with the Hoppians, uh, a more conservative immigration view, or do you tend to stand more with the Blancians? I'm torn on that one. It's a difficult one because as a, as a plumb line libertarian, I really can never defend the – the police, you know, the police state arm of our federal government, which is in charge of defending the borders, um, and 
in a free society, immigration wouldn't really even be a thing because you just have private domains everywhere. But by and large, I think, especially in the U.S., immigration is a good thing. Diversity is good. More people is good. We have more division of labor, um, more human capital. Um, of course, it's done for political reasons now. The Democrats are going to uh, grant amnesty and increase immigration to increase the Democrat vote. Um, I think that there's something to the Hoppian criticism of immigration as forced integration. I think Hans's basic point, which is misunderstood by his critics, is that – so his first best solution, which is mine and which is any principal libertarians, is to decentralize political power down to the individual unit so that this question becomes a non-question. But so long as we have a state, especially a democratic state, which makes a rational policy, right? Um, as long as you have the state and you have public property that the state owns and you have voting and voting rights and welfare rights and um, uh, you also have anti-discrimination law, then you have – someone is going to be harmed by immigration one way or the other. Um, Hans calls these – Hoppe calls these forced integration and forced exclusion, and he opposes both, and so do I. Forced exclusion is if… If the state doesn't have completely open borders and limits some immigrants from coming in, even if I want to invite them onto my property or to my my factory to like to be my guest or to be my worker, then my rights are being violated, which is correct. Um, however, if immigrants come in and they can get on welfare and they can vote, and especially if they can use the public roads and anti-discrimination law to – Travel across the country and to move into neighborhoods that would be naturally more segregated and to live there because you can't discriminate because of anti discrimination laws, that would cause forced integration uh, as a crude thing, which violates people's rights as well. Right? Because we, now we have to pay taxes, we have to let them vote, we have to live near people we wouldn't otherwise live with near. Although, as personally as a cosmopolitan libertarian who likes diversity, I don't really personally prefer a world or to live. In a in a lily white you know conservative neighborhood, I, I like a mix. You know, I love New York City. I love the melting pot kind of thing. But some people do tend to segregate. Even in like say Houston, my city, which is I think one of the most diverse cities in the country. Um, you know, it's like say one fourth black, one fourth white, one fourth Hispanic, and one fourth Asian, all mixed together. People tend to live in areas and they're, they're not forced to by the government. You know, there's the there's the there's the Chinatown area. There's you know. Uh, Hispanic areas, etc. People do tend to segregate. Um, if you force them to live near each other artificially, then that's that's a problem. And if you didn't have a de democratic state, you wouldn't have these rules, and it wouldn't be as much of a problem. Um, so I think the solution to the problem in both directions is to make the state as small as possible, to get rid of democracy, and to decentralize as much as possible. Um, I mean, I, we're not going to have anarchy anytime soon, if ever. So if you had a world of, say, 10,000 Liechtensteins, like small states run by a small monarch, responsive to the people, having a rational immigration policy, that would be far better than what we have now. Uh, did, <clears throat> did you ever meet Rothbard? I did. I went to – I was living in Philadelphia as a young lawyer, and uh, in 1994 – uh, and I had never met – I had never met Rothbard or Rockwell or David Gordon or Walter Block or Hoppe, but um, I had read their works. I had written some stuff on Hoppe, and uh, they, they had a conference in Crystal City, Virginia, which is right by D.C. It was the John Randolph meeting. That was at the time of the second fusionism where the kind of paleoconservatives and the paleo libertarians were trying to get together, and they had a conference there, and I didn't care about the, the, the paleo conservatives, but I wanted to meet Hoppe. And so I went down by train, and I met Hans, and we became good friends then. And I met Rothbard. And we sat for quite a while in the um, um, in the in, in in one of the auditoriums alone together, maybe for half an hour before the the speakers filed in. And we talked about a lot of things that had it. I, it was great. He signed my book for me, my Man, Economy, and State. And then he died two months later in January of '95. So I did meet him, and. Um, at the time, you know, he he Hans had Hoppe had been here for ten years working under Rothbard. He had been with him in New York, and then they moved to Las Vegas together at UNLV. And and Hoppe 
after Rothbard died, Hoppe became the editor of the Journal of Libertarian Studies, and he became the co-editor of the Review of Austrian Economics with Joe Salerno and um, I forgot who else, maybe Jeffrey Hervener. And he asked me to be the book review editor for the JLS, which I did for quite a while. So I quickly got thrown into things after Rothbard passed. Because Rothbard – one second. Rothbard had been the editor of both the Review of Austrian Economics and the Journal of Libertarian Studies. So when he died, that had to be handled by his, uh, his chief, his chief uh, followers. What is your favorite uh, memory with, with Hoppe? Well, I had a lot of favorite memories. I've been with him so many times, uh, but I, I'd say two favorite memories. Uh, one was one that's a little embarrassing. Um, in two, I think it was 2000, he, he was invited uh, – so you've heard of the Moonies. You guys ever heard of the Moonies? It's sort of this uh, South Korean – religious cult this kind of neo-christian guy reverend sun young moon he's not that well known anymore i think he died actually but um his cult still survives the moonies they believed he was the reincarnation of jesus and his wife his third wife was the the the, the godmother or something like that um <laughs> and they had lots of money and they were conservative in their politics and he i think he bought one of the american papers and he got convicted of tax evasion and sent to prison in america for a while so he hated the government actually but he would have these conferences around the world usually in asia like taiwan or singapore and sometimes korea and i think he had a big stake in korean airlines too and there was so he would have this international annual conference called ICAS, the International Conference on the Unity of the Sciences, and they would invite all these thinkers from around the world like physicists and anthropologists and economists and everything. They would pay their way, and they would go there, and they would meet other people and give talks on a different number of things. Some of them were mystical moonies, and some were just regular people, and they would do this to give themselves legitimate. I think Dan Quayle, the, he was the former vice president. In 2000, when I went, um, Dan Quayle was there to speak. You know, they so they had tons of money and they 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 wanted to have legitimacy. So they had a free market subgroup, um, which was run by some libertarians, uh, some Hayekians, and he had he got old and he was resigning, and so Hoppe got asked to take that over. So that year in 2000, they gave Hans carte blanche to bring like up to 13 people with them. And they would pay their way and pay us a fee. So he invited me and uh, Walter Block and a bunch of uh, Guido Holtzman um, to go to Korea. So we went to Korea on an expense-paid trip, and we spoke at this Mooney conference just to each other, really, on anarchist theory. That was fun, and I remember at, at, at lunch one day, there was a guy I didn't know on our panel. He was, he was a meteorologist from Maine. And I thought he was just a libertarian I had never heard of, but he was really a Mooney plant, or he was the Mooney on our panel, but I didn't know he was a Mooney. So he asked me a question at lunch about the Moonies, and I just started spouting off about how they're a religious cult and everything. And um, afterwards, Hans told me, Stefan, you know, that was a Mooney. I said, oh, no. And so he never got invited back, and he, he sort of blamed me for that, although I think they started falling apart after that anyway. Uh, but about two years ago, the Mises UK was launched by some of our friends who had gone to the PF Property and Freedom Society meetings, Kira Martland and Andy Duncan and um, some of these guys. And uh, a group of us, they were good friends, um, mostly from Las Vegas, the people that knew Hans when he taught there, uh, Leah Glody, Doug French, uh, Jeff Barr, um, and Hans. And we all decided to go to London like we had a guy trip that – that weekend, it was uh, five of us, and Hans flew from Turkey. My friends flew from Las Vegas. I flew from Houston, and we just had like the best weekend. We went to museums, we went to pubs. So that was a really went to restaurants. That was a really fun time, um, and um, we're hoping to do it again maybe when COVID um, relaxes and uh, Mises UK has another another thing. London's a fun fun city. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on fractional reserve banking? Uh, do you agree with the Rothbardian view, or do you take the the free banking position? Well, 
I've never agreed with Rothbardians on the legality issue. Um, I don't think that it's per se fraud. I do think that in practice it has been fraudulent, but it, it could be done in a non-fraudulent way. As long as the bank gives adequate warning to a customer, I say caveat emptor. You know, um, if, if a customer is stupid enough to give his money um, to a fractional reserve bank, knowing they're going to lend it out, and he they might he might lose his money because of the possibility and indeed inevitability of bank runs. Hey. There's a, a sucker parted with his money every moment. Um, with the Rothbardians on the economic case, I think fractional reserve banking is completely unnecessary. It makes no sense whatsoever. I think the central mistake that's made, which I haven't seen anyone else point out, which I keep making, but I'm not an economist, but still I have an opinion. And my opinion is the, the central mistake is is uh well, there's two central mistakes, but ultimately they believe that money they equate they conflate money with wealth. I think you can never print money and cause wealth. You can never increase the supply of money and cause there to be more wealth because wealth is not money. Money is a unique good that's just used to intermediate between goods that are wealth. Right? If you double the supply of money overnight, you don't increase wealth. Um, and Likewise, there's never a reason to increase the supply of money and expect that to increase wealth, which is what the free bankers believe. And the reason they believe that, I believe, is they believe in the type of market failure. They think that in an unregul uh, in a free market, uh, um, uh, the, you will have cases where there's an ex excess demand for money, but you can't get it because that would cause prices to go down, deflation, and that would ultimately cause wages to fall in nominal terms, and and workers are too stupid. To understand that it's okay if your wage goes down in numbered in numerical terms as long as your purchasing power is even greater. I think they're not too stupid. They they you know if you say hey I'm pay I'm being paid ten ounces of gold a year this year but I'm being paid only nine ounces next year but that nine ounces buys me more than ten bought me last year. Everyone's okay with that. That's that's a good thing. Um, but they, they call the sticky wages downward. They think wages are sticky from some psychological effect. They they can't adjust fast enough, and therefore you need to increase the supply of money by lowering the reserve ratio at a fractional reserve bank to basically print more credit so as to avoid dislocations that would happen, um, which is, I think is a type of market failure. I don't think there would be such a market failure, so I think there's no reason to ever have a fractional reserve bank, and I think if you had them, as Guido Holzman points out in some of his stuff on this, uh, it's inevitable that they would fail because of a bank run. The reason they don't fail now is because they're backed up by – Government insurance, right? But in a free market, you wouldn't have insurance, and so they would ha a run would be inevitable. A run would be inevitable because if you loan some money out, then the assets the bank holds to back up all the claims of the deposit, the so-called depositors. Some of those assets are loans to people that are doing business ventures, and some of those will fail, right? You can't predict how many will fail, but some will fail. And when they when two, when more than a certain amount fail, then the bank is insolvent. And it runs inevitable, and so then the, the contrary argument would be, well, you could just get private insurance. But as Mises showed in in Human Action, um, when he distinguishes between class and case probability, you cannot insure against business risk. It's just impossible uh, because that's the, the you're trying to take the entrepreneur's job to an insurance company, and that's just not possible. They can only insure against class probability, not case probability. So private insurance of a a bank would it would be impossible to get private insurance, um, and therefore runs are inevitable, and people would soon not want to put their money into a bank uh, just to get some small interest payment at the risk of losing everything. So I think there would be a clear distinction in a free market between um, holding money and between a risky investment. So I think people would hold some of their wealth in money, and that means a solid money like gold or better, better yet Bitcoin. And then the rest of their their wealth they would they would put into more productive things like the stock market, which can earn a higher return than the, the deflation returns from from money, and but at the risk of losing it. Okay, so we've got a few questions on books, and then we can start to wrap up this interview. Uh, what do you think is the most essential book for a libertarian? I guess it 
Well, if you're already a libertarian, I mean, then the work is done. So I guess it would be for, for newbies or for outsiders wanting to learn about it, and that depends upon their level of economic knowledge and what they can read. Uh, my sort of central book is Hoppe's Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Like that's a core book. Uh, but there are lots of overview books or starting places you can start with. I think I have a bibliography of books I recommend. It's called uh, – if you go to my website, stephankinsella.com, and go under my publications tab… I have something called uh, The Greatest Libertarian Books, and if you click there, I, I link there to Hoppe's Anarcho-Capitalist Bibliography plus my own list of, of books. And you know, there are books like Rothbard's For a New Liberty, which is, which is key, uh, and his Ethics of Liberty too, and also like The Law by Bastiat. And then for economics, you know, there's Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Um, for Mises, I think Mises is essential actually. I think Austrian economics in particular, not just free market economics, but – and not just Austrian, but Mises' version, his praxeological approach. I actually think it's not human action, which is more technical and has a lot of stuff that the average libertarian thinker doesn't need. I think it's his, um, his ultimate foundation of economic science, which is a slim volume. It's his last one that he wrote, I believe. Uh, it's sort of an update of his earlier one called Epistemological Problems of Economics, but I think it's even better. So that's my favorite Mises book, Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, which goes into the methodology of economics, right? which I think um, plays a role in, in libertarian thinking too um, because it helps you understand means the means and ends framework of human action, which you have to understand to do good political theory analysis too. Right. Um, so I don't think there's a single book out there. Actually, Jacob Hubert's book, Libertarianism Today, is a really good book, which has an overview of different areas of, of, of libertarian thinking. Uh, it's written more for the layman, like for a Ron Paul type audience, but Hubert is really solid on Austrian theory and on radical um, Rothbardian type theory, and he's got a good chapter on intellectual property in there too. So that's a really good starting book. Um, the title's a little bit misleading, Libertarianism Today. It sounds more like a, you know, um, a narrow book about libertarian activism, but it's really more of a good overview of different areas of libertarian thought. So as someone who's studied uh, libertarianism and libertarian economics for a long time, what is your favorite Rothbard book? I really like the um, the Logic of Action, it's Volume One or Two. I think it's been replaced by um, a newer book, partly because they, when they retitled it, they could put it online. <laughs> Logic of Action One and Two are not online, but that's a really. Uh, if you Google it, the logic of action one and two, I, I can't remember the title now. It's called, called something like – I don't think it's making economic sense. It, it may be that one or another one, uh, but you could find it if you Google what's the replacement book for logic of action one and two. That's my fa – although for new liberty and, and ethics of liberty for libertarianism per se are good, but the logic of uh, the, the – uh, the logic of – what is it? What did I say it was? The logic of action? The logic of action one and two are really good on his economics. It's a good overview. Another really good one is the free market reader, which is um, basically a collection of articles written by Rothbard and Lou Rockwell in their old free market newsletter that the Mises is too used to publish. That's sort of anal that's sort of comparable to Hazlitt's Economic in One Lesson. That's sort of a beginner book, like little short chapters on the minimum wage and things like that. Um, but I really love – I love The Ethics of Liberty uh, by Rothbard, and I also love his Logic of Action 1 and 2. So we've got one more question before we uh, before we wrap things up here, and as we leave, we feel it's it's important to go with kind of a more serious question, and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's in relation to an image, and we'd like for you to kind of, kind of interpret this image, uh, if you will. Uh, what is what is the meaning behind? I'm gonna share my screen for you. Um, what is the meaning behind behind this image? I still don't know. There was some. I think a Brazilian guy, if I recall. There's a lot of. I spoke in Brazil one time. And there's a lot of Brazilian libertarians and Austrians, and this Brazilian guy kept asking me to do the bucket thing, and I didn't know what he was talking about, and he assumed I knew some kind of meme. And 
I, I said, he just said, just put a bucket on your head and take a picture. So I, I got my son to take a picture of me putting a bucket on my head. I still don't, I still don't know what it's about. <laughs> they were happy. They were happy that I played along with their meme. That's all I knew. Do you know what it is? <laughs> I have, no, I, have, I think you might have gotten tricked. <laughs> I have no clue. I, 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 I thought there was a 15% chance I might be being punked, but I did it anyway. I did it anyway. <laughs> Well, I think that just about wraps up things here. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And especially thank you to, uh, to Stefan Kinsella for, for doing this stream with us. It is, it, it's surely been a pleasure. And uh, the, the chat is very satisfied with this interview. And it, it, it has been a, a good learning experience for, for us and the chat. And uh, thank you so much for coming in. Is there anything else you would like to say? Uh, I have a – I've been working for a while on an edited – selection of my articles on libertarian theory for a long time it's been in the background but i think i will have it finished in a in a couple of months so that will be coming out this year it's going to be called law in a libertarian world and i have a link to it on my home page which has all the material up already uh in non-edited form or in, in the original form but um that that should be coming out this year All right, well, we'll leave a link to his personal website down in the description if you want to go check it out. Thank you, everyone, so much for tuning into the stream. It has been a great stream, and we will see you next week with our with our newest stream. Maybe we'll have a leftist on. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This has been Blue Politics, Benjamin Politics, Manchester King, and our special guest, Stefan Kinsella. <laughs>